which American president read a book every day and wrote a book every year while serving in the White House? Let me offer you several hints. His published works comprise 23 volumes of history, natural history, biography, political philosophy, and essays, including two books, The Naval War of 1812 and a four-volume Winning of the West, that are considered definitive by professional historians even five or six decades later. He exercised regularly in the White House library by wrestling with a Japanese wrestler, sometimes including in the fray a three-way wrestling match, including the 300-pound William Howard Taft, who was then the Secretary of War. That's not enough, hence he graduated from Harvard in 1880. He was the first American to win the Nobel Prize. A sickly youth, he spent time in what would today be called pumping iron, building up his body, and horse riding out west, tracking down and killing buffalo, bear, and other wild animals, and in the Spanish-American War led the Rough Riders against Spanish troops in Cuba. Woodrow Wilson called him, quote, the most dangerous man of the age, close quote. Mark Twain judged him to be, quote, clearly insane, close quote. As his English friend Sir Cecil Spring Rice observed, quote, you must always remember that the president is about six years old, close quote. <laughs> now you can find these in many more interesting facets of this extraordinary political life in Edmund Morris's The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. The book won the 1980 Pulitzer Prize for Biography and the National Book Award. It is quite simply the best political biography I've had the opportunity to read in more than a decade. From its pages spring to life a political animal whose combination of energy, intellect, and enthusiasm represents a profound challenge to all of us. Indeed, one confronts in this human being the exuberance of a quintessential American at the dawn of the American century. That a book of such refined feel for the nuances of American political life should have been written by an individual born in Nairobi, Kenya, who studied at Rhodes University in South Africa and grew up in England before becoming a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1979, is also truly remarkable. I'm sitting on the edge of my seat awaiting the second volume of this three-volume trilogy on the Roosevelt presidency scheduled for publication in 1988 under the wonderful title Theodore Rex. <laughs> Edmund Morris was chosen last fall by President Reagan to serve as his Boswell, as it were. A unique arrangement allows him greater access to a sitting president his personal papers and regular interviews than has been afforded any previous historian. For example, at last fall's Geneva summit, he accompanied President Reagan during the meetings with Secretary General, Soviet Secretary General Gorbachev. As an advance on this official biography, Morris has received from the publisher, Random House, what's reported to be the most lucrative nonfiction contract in publishing history reported to be half again larger than David Stockman's $2 million. <laughs> it's with very great pleasure and great expectations that we welcome to Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government tonight, Edmund Morris to address the subject, quote, the black crystal, Theodore Roosevelt and the art of political imagery. Edmund. Good evening, everybody. Don't believe, don't believe a word he says. It's all rumor and that's none of it true. Um, seriously, I, I'm very touched by what you said and, um, and the nice things people were saying upstairs. And I will only say that I'm very lucky in that, um, uh, in many ways, I had the, the writer's dream, which is to be vouchsafed a subject which uh, had not been done in, in, in great detail before, which was a natural subject from a literary point of view, 
I was vouchsafed a life which uh, is surely one of the most interesting in American history and it would take a very poor writer not to make uh, literary capital out of it. Um, I often like to say that if it wasn't for um, Theodore Roosevelt, well, I felt that at the time I got the Pulitzer Prize that it was that really he should have a, a large part of the credit, should be listed as a recipient of the prize with me, but in alphabetical order. <laughs> One of the minor inconveniences of being a published writer is that people are always accosting you at cocktail parties and um, quoting you the opening lines of their novels in progress. Uh, you get so that you can recognize the symptoms. This sort of lowering of the voice, um, a sudden intake of breath, and then a glazing of the eyes, such as precedes antiperistalsis, and then out it comes. What do you think of this, Mr. Morris? I thought of starting with, call me Herbert. <laughs> or, um, how about Lefty answered the phone and his face turned white as a war? Well, you have to let them down gracefully. Um, I think it would be more interesting if you called your protagonist Ishmael, but then you might run into copyright problems. <laughs> um, and somebody really did say that to me about um, the war. Well, you know, it's very, very dramatic, that business of picking up the phone, Bob, but, um, you know, why does a wall? That's, that's kind of strange. Walls are not necessarily white. How about, well, why did you say his face turned white as a sheet? So this guy said to me with a great deal of hauteur, because white as a sheet is a cliche. <laughs> he said, I only deal in original images ordinary images of the man in the street. Well, he was wrong. There's nothing the man in the street responds to more than an extraordinary image. And anyone who wishes to communicate with the man in the street, writers, politicians, uh, the man in the street being the average reader, the average voter, must avoid cliché but express himself as simply and powerfully and memorably as he can. To get the reader's attention, to get the voter's attention, you have to hit him over the head with a big stick. And no American president has ever understood the power of original political imagery uh, better than that peerless square dealer, man in the arena, battler for the Lord, and carrier of big sticks, Theodore Roosevelt. The man himself was an image, uh, such, a, such a unique and arresting image that um, to this day he remains very sharply etched in the American folk consciousness. I remember when I was first beginning to work on him in 1975, I was in Washington and noticed in the newspaper that um, Leonard Bernstein and um, Alan J. Lerner were opening with their new musical called 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue at the National Theater, a tryout before it came to New York. And uh, in the article, it, it said that this musical consisted in of vignettes of life from the White House between the years 1800 and 1900, ending with a slight degree of historical inaccuracy with the Theodore Roosevelt's, who actually only came in in 1901, but still. I wanted to see what T.R. and Edith Roosevelt would look like on stage in a Bernstein Lerner musical, so I went to it and um, sat through two and a half hours of really excruciating boredom. It was a, as you may know, it was one of the all-time dogs on Broadway. It ran for about 15 minutes. <laughs> However, it uh, was performed by two actors, Ken Howard and I think Sadie Thompson, um, alternating roles of presidents and first ladies with quick changes of disguise, quick props. And the audience sat through it all in leaden dullness right up until the end when finally Ken Howard whipped out a false mustache and clamped it onto his lip, slapped on some pants and and went like this to the audience. The whole theater burst into delighted applause. And I said to my wife, you know, this is really weird. There's something about that image which registers in the American consciousness. Now, this is 1975. 
TR was then, hadn't had a big book written about him for a long time. Why was he still so powerfully remembered and what was it? This atmosphere, this, this feeling of, of positivism, of strength, of decency. Well, what it was, of course, was the potency of his image. Why is the image so vivid still in this age of computers and um, robots? He survives as a symbol of his own creation. A symbol, as H.G. Wells said of him, the very symbol of the creative will in man. Not only because of what he was, but very largely because of what he presented himself as. I can only think, um, leaving aside the present president, whom I don't want to talk about, I can only think of two other presidents who have had TR's gift of self-presentation, FDR and JFK. Uh, but the former's voice was audible from coast to coast on the radio. It was magnificently suited to the radio. And we all know how gorgeous JFK looked on television. TR, who was neither euphonious nor gorgeous, had to do it all in print with his own writing. He had to present himself and his policies through his own language. Also, of course, to small audiences, and uh, the speeches would then be reprinted for mass readership. But primarily, he had to present himself in literary fashion. And the measure of his success in doing so uh, is the explanation of the vividness of his image in our memory today. Throughout his 38 years of active political life, he relentlessly combined force of utterance with originality of expression. As um, Browning punned, awful pun, a man's speech must exceed his grasp, else what's a metaphor? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but TR indulged in more than metaphor. He was equally at home in similes, in uh, slogans, and catchphrases, and proverbs, proverbs of suspiciously obscure origin. Speak softly and carry a big stick, for example. He always used to cite as an old West African proverb. Well, I come from Africa, and I've never met a West African who's heard of it yet. <laughs> but whatever the word play, um, from near quasi-poetic conceits, which he was capable of from time to time, to the most colloquial home truths, whatever the image, it almost always paid off for him in, in, in the rhetorical and the political sense. We have to remember that TR was long before he became a politician, uh, a published and a very professional writer. Graham has cited how many volumes he churned out. He was precociously literary, even as a small boy, pouring out his impressions of um, his life, uh, his travels and his studies in diaries and in letters and in published treatises. He began to publish in his teens, ornithological works, natural histories, he was, um, his instinct in any time of stress or sorrow or excitement was always to reach for a pen before he would speak about it. So his primary instinct was that of a writer as a, as a young boy. Uh, the politician developed slightly later. But, and it could also be said, I think, that in becoming a politician in his early 20s, he cramped uh, the growth of what might have been a literary gift of, um, of the high second-rate quality. He would never, I think, have become a first-rate writer. Um, he, for, for one example, totally lacked curiosity about human character. He um, had very little interest in his own deeper workings, which I'll get into later. He was also not capable of sustained originality of metaphor, but the, 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 the ones he did get off were very powerful, and it's perhaps best that he did end up, as he was, a politician. Anyway, as a writer, uh, original imagery did come fairly naturally to him, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of pleasing 
uh, images in his non-political writing. To give you a few examples, I like to drink the wine of life with brandy in it. Or, black care rarely sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. When he was uh, sitting in his ranch in the winter of 1884-85, looking out over the Little Missouri during the Great Freeze, it, he described it as a blue bar of bent steel. He um, would watch the wings of birds in action in the sky, and he would be reminded of a, quote, sort of shifting cuneiform script in the air. Charging up San Juan Hill in battle, he felt rising inside of him, quote, a wolf rising in the heart. The passage is, or any man who has the real power of joy in battle in him knows what it is when the wolf rises in his heart. These are, um, this, is, these, this is powerful stuff, and it's all original. It gives you an idea of the gifts that he might have been able to develop if he'd stayed with writing. He was good at uh, humorous analogies, too. There was um, the Oyster Bay fishmonger, a bearded fishmonger, who looked like um, a queer sea growth from among his own clams. <laughs> there was um, there's a delicious portrait of um, little Kermit Roosevelt and his school buddies who were all going through the teething stage, the second teething stage, and uh, T.R. described them as um, a class of ruminants varied by the occasional narwhal. <laughs> and then there's his immortal image of currant jelly, which has been revived quite some recently. As in his letter of 1915 to William Roscoe Thayer of this university, he wrote, you could no more make an agreement with Colombian government leaders at the time of the Panama Canal crisis and then you could nail current jelly to the wall. The failure to nail current jelly to the wall is not due to the nail, it's due to the current jelly. <laughs> William Sapphire wrote a column on this image recently, uh, in which um, he had used it himself and uh, said that it was a fairly recent origin, and he was taken to task by several scholarly readers who traced it back and back and back, and the original was generally agreed to be this. Certainly, I've never been able to find an earlier example of this incomparable image of current jelly being nailed to the wall. His maiden speech to the New York Assembly in uh, 1882, January 24th, 1882, uh, was short and, um, from the rhetorical point of view, is not particularly interesting. I won't quote it to you because it's, it's, there is absolutely no original imagery in it at all, but I will briefly tell you what he said. The situation in the New York State Assembly at that time was that there was, um, when the assembly opened for business in early New Year, there was a conflict of power between the two halves of the Democratic Party, between the Jeffersonians and the, Tilden, the um, Tammany Hall reactionary bunch. And TR got up to say, that it was quite all right for them to continue squabbling, the two wings of the party, and holding up the business of the assembly. Because from what he'd heard from his friends and Republicans in New York City, they really didn't need any legislation that year. They were doing very well, thank you. And the Democrats could continue squabbling as long as they liked, as far as TR was concerned, and then he sat down. The um, speech received some attention in the paper, the following day, it was remarked that he, the skinny young fop from the Silk Stocking District, spoke with considerable amount of force. He had a rather funny accent. He said, uh, nothing happens, we will all be rather relieved. Uh, people giggled about it, but nevertheless, they were impressed with uh, his uh, complete unselfconsciousness and um, the, uh, the explosive force with which he spoke. But the speech interests me because it shows T.R. at the very outset of his political career, playing off one side of a situation against the other side of the situation, left versus right, liberal versus, uh, versus conservative, old versus young, whatever the case. This, throughout his life, he always played opposing forces off, and he always instinctively found the center of gravity between the two. 
So while the raft, if we think of it as a raft, was tipping back and forth, left and right, forward and backward, TR was serenely positioned in the middle, perfectly balanced, uh, maintaining the center of the political mood of the moment, which he flawlessly did for almost the entire course of his political career. He was a compulsive, instinctive centrist. It was a standing joke among his friends that um, the one cliché, he did not on the whole deal with many clichés, but the one cliché he could never resist and which he used all the time was, on the other hand, he would state something with enormous force and um, certitude and um, everybody would be terribly excited by what he'd said and then he would say, on the other hand, it would be equally forcible in putting over the uh, opposing point of view and the audience would go out really rather mystified as to what he thought, but impressed by the fact that he thought a lot of things very vigorously. <laughs> There's a classic example in his book, The Rough Riders, his account of his war exploits in Cuba, where he um, talks about uh, a gallant young man from Yale being killed in battle. And instinctively and quickly he adds, and a number of equally gallant young men from Harvard were also killed. Early on in his first term in Albany, he delivered himself of the first of his great epigrams, or should I say catchphrases. He was talking about the rather corrupt uh, owners of the New York elevated Manhattan elevated railroad. And he described them in a moment of inspiration as the wealthy criminal class. It was a phrase which in the rather florid and uh, wordy political language of the day struck home with enormous force. It was much reprinted in the papers for the next few weeks, the wealthy criminal class, and he got such political capital out of it that he repeated that phrase with minor variations for the rest of his career. Later on, it became malefactors of great wealth in the second term of his presidency. But the criminal rich, malefactors of great wealth, the aristocracy of the bad. He uh, used these phrases often. Uh, like all proud writers, when he got himself a nice phrase, he uh, didn't let it lie there. He repeated it again and again and again until it finally sank like shrapnel into the brains of the people he was addressing. He was a great believer in repetition, uh, which is something that his biographer rather wearily has to take account of. Simultaneously, in his first years in Albany, he showed, apart from his gift of epigram, an impressive mastery of vituperation. Nobody, even in that free-swinging era, could match him in savagery, uh, in, in political abuse. You, there was one, there was one time when he was um, pitching for the impeachment of a Supreme Court justice in New York State, Judge Westbrook, and um, sensed in the assembly that the movement, political movement, was going away from him. What seemed like a likely, likely impeachment was now becoming unlikely because the Judiciary Committee were voting not to impeach this judge. So T.R. got very hysterical and jumped up and screamed in his high falsetto voice, Beware lest you, f uh, lest you, uh, no, excuse me. You cannot cleanse the leper, he screamed. Beware lest you taint yourself with his leprosy. Now, he got off many better things than this later in his career, but I cite it because that word leper attached itself to poor Judge Westbrook. Uh, to such an extent that even though he was exonerated uh, and found to be an honorable man, the image of the leper which T.R. laid on him stuck with him the rest of his career. And T.R. for the rest of his own career polished these powers of invective with effective and often quite funny results. He described the New York world, for example, under the editorship, the ownership of Jay Gould as a local stock-jobbing sheet of limited circulation and unlimited mendacity, 
owned by the arch thief of Wall Street and edited by a rancorous kleptomaniac with a penchant for trousers. <laughs> there was another Supreme Court justices, I don't know what it was about Supreme Court, but he really got off on attacking them. Uh, a Supreme Court justice whom he um, castigated as that amiable old fuzzy buzzy with sweetbread brains. <laughs> Sir Mortimer Durand, the, the unfortunate British ambassador to Washington during his presidency was, uh, <clears throat> he complained that the ambassador has a brain that functions at six guinea pig power. <laughs> President Castro of Venezuela was, quote, an unspeakably villainous little monkey, not to his face, I presume, President Marroquin of Colombia was a pithy canthropoid. <laughs> Critics of his Panama policy were a small body of shrill eunuchs. <laughs> and Henry James was that little emasculated mass of inanities. <laughs> now, if you notice a certain desire to castrate here, to render his opponents impotent, you're dead right. Um, it was another fundamental of his political behavior throughout his career. Those who opposed him, in particular, liberals, academics, intellectuals of the inactive sort, people who stayed in the cloister, in the study. These people were almost invariably described in terms of lack of masculinity. At one time or another, he castrated almost the entire faculty of this august institution. <laughs> There's a prime example from an 1894 essay called What Americanism Means, in which his target was once again the unfortunate Henry James. He said, in passing, Thus it is for the undersized man of letters who flees his country because he, with his delicate, effeminate sensitiveness, finds the conditions of life on this side of the water crude and raw. In other words, because he finds that he cannot play a man's part among men, and so goes where he will be sheltered from the winds that harden starter souls. To which poor Henry James could only reply, the national consciousness for Mr. Theodore Roosevelt is at best a very fierce affair. Later on, after more of the same, James described him as a dangerous and ominous jingo, and he got the final word in 1912 when he dismissed T.R. finally and devastatingly as the mere monstrous, monstrous embodiment of unprecedented and resounding noise, <laughs> with a capital N. Now, if this kind of heterosexual bluster, which incidentally is very similar to Hemingway's, was distasteful on the personal level, it was marvelously effective on the political level. Even uh, when T.R. was himself a weedy, asthmatic assemblyman with post-adolescent carbuncles and bouts of nervous diarrhea. He managed by the force of his language to project this, this image of himself as, quote, an aggressive fighter for the right. Another one of his pet phrases. Aggressive fighting for the right is the noblest sport that, uh, that man affords. I can't remember the exact words. He, um, the American public, he sensed dearly loves a fighter, and uh, hence the spectacular success of the mature or the maturing Theodore Roosevelt's speech to the Hamilton Club of Chicago in uh, April 1899. He rose before this audience of like-minded conservative Republicans of patrician background, um, visibly uh, a hero of the recent war in Spain audibly an oracle of American imperialism and palpably a future president. And in words which were both eloquent and scary, he shouted in this high rasping voice with his teeth clicking and 
his spectacle ribbons dancing, his, left, his right fist punching against his left palm. I'll quote it. I wish to preach to you the doctrine of the strenuous life, not the life of ignoble ease, but the life of endeavor, strenuously lived. He preferred the phrase vigor de vita later, but the, the phrase strenuous life uh, was seized upon. Uh, translated all over the world. He published a book of essays in which this particular speech was reproduced and the title, The Strenuous Life, much translated, uh, became part of political language all over the, uh, the Western world. He was very proud of it and he used it a lot after that. In the course of the speech he went on to castigate pacifists and anti-imperialists, his old um, targets for lack of courage, lack of appetite for the, what he called the serious work of this world. And one by one, in the course of speech, all his political, his emerging political beliefs came, beliefs came up for utterance. Men must, quote, dare and endure and labor. Women must be wise and fearless mothers of many healthy children. In other words, they had to labor too. As for family planning, any virile nation that condoned it must be rotten to the heart's core, he said. Later on, this attitude to, to restriction of childbirth uh, matured, if you can use that word, into the savage phrase, race suicide. In 1902, he wrote a long um, letter to a woman who espoused the doctrine of voluntary child um, restriction, in which he um, sounded off about race suicide at great length. Uh, saying in effect that for the, uh, for the governing, the, the, the elite part of society to restrict its childbearing while the lower echelons of society were re reproducing at fecund rates was to lead to a gradual thinning of the upper class, the governing class as he liked to call it, and a general uh, deterioration of the race. Race used in a very loose sense the American race. But the, uh, the phrase race suicide stuck with the, um, the Burr-like tenacity of so many of his political phrases. And he used it to great effect in his campaign for the presidency in 1904. I'll talk about that a little more later on. From um, race suicide, or at least from restriction of childbirth and this being a rotten tendency in, in the speech, he segued very naturally to praise of those splendid phallic symbols, battleships. As a child, he confessed once that he would be, that he loved to read about ships, ships, ships. His first published book, which he began here in Harvard before, long before he graduated, was the Naval War of 1812, a book which is almost unread today because of its extremely technical nature. But the mastery of ballistics in it, in a young literary chap who up till then had had no understanding of mathematics and no aptitude for ornaments at all, the mastery of ballistics is quite extraordinary. And I can only conclude that it was this, this fascination with guns, with armaments, that became more and more pronounced as he grew older. My wife, in researching the life of his wife, noticed that whenever Edith Roosevelt produced a child. Tia's instinctive reaction at the time when labor was approaching was to head for the west and blast away at every animal he could see on the horizon. He loved guns passionately. He had a gun room up on the top floor of his house at Sagamore Hill. He would play with them and oil them and stroke them. And uh, his rhetoric as president sometimes becomes, if you're psychologically inclined, quite kinky when he gets onto the subject of, of naval cannon. There's a, there's, a, there's a phrase in his first message uh, about the great guns that hammer out mastery of the high seas. He called in his strenuous life speech on Americans to take up the duties of imperial possession of the Philippines 
what his friend and fellow imagist Rudyard Kipling might call the white man's burden, in fact did call the white man's burden. And then he ended magnificently. Whether you like his philosophy or not, you've got to admit this is magnificent rhetoric. I preached to you then, my countrymen, that our country calls not for the life of ease, but for the life of strenuous endeavor. The 20th century looms before us, big with the fate of many nations. If we stand idly by, if we seek merely swollen, slothful ease and ignoble peace, if we shrink from the hard contests where men must win at hazard of their lives and at the risk of all they hold dear, then the bolder and the stronger peoples will pass us by and will win for themselves the domination of this world. Let us therefore boldly face the life of strife, resolute to do our duty well and manfully, resolute to uphold righteousness by deed and by word, resolute to be honest and brave, to serve high ideals, and yet to use practical methods. Above us, above all, let us shrink from no strife, moral or physical, within or without the nation, provided we are certain that the strife is justified for it is only through strife, through hard and dangerous endeavor, that we shall ultimately win the goal of true national greatness. The impact of that speech was enormous. Uh, my own theory is that it catapulted his ascent to the presidency. From that moment on, Governor Theodore Roosevelt was the coming man, the man of destiny. These are all quotes. Um, he galloped to the White House in uh, the, this, the, the fall of 1901. A few days before he accidentally succeeded, accidentally and inevitably succeeded to power, he came out with that phrase, the 20th century stands before us big with the fate of many nations, again at the State Fair in Minnesota. And went on to say, the young giant of the West stands ready to run as a strong man eager to run a race. Unquestionably, he was talking about the United States, poised at the threshold of world power, but unquestionably, he was also speaking about himself. By then, he'd built up his body. He proved himself as a hero in war. He'd killed his man. He'd married his women. He'd fathered six children. He didn't have to worry anymore about projecting an effete image. He was himself demonstrably a young giant of the West. As president, for the first year or so, he moderated his rhetoric quite noticeably for very good political reasons. He was inheriting the mantle of William McKinley, who was a very beloved president. He had sworn during his inauguration at Buffalo to uphold the policies of McKinley quite unchanged and therefore felt uh, in his heart that he didn't need to rock the boat too much, if I may be forgiven that cliche. Also, he had power then, so he didn't have to bluster quite as much as he had when he was younger. He could get his message over by acts rather than words, hence the, the dinner with Booker T. Washington in the fall in October of 1901, the first time that a white president ever sat down with a black man in his own house. For example, the, the suit against the antitrust suit against Northern Securities was burst, burst like a bombshell in February of 1902. And for a third example, his settlement of the Great Coal Strike in the fall of 1902, the first time that a president has ever physically intervened between capital and labor in a major dispute in our history. But then in 1903, when the nomination for the presidency in 1904 began to loom as something which was by no means assured, Mark Hanna, the senior man of the Republican Party, was, was beginning to look increasingly like uh, a likely nominee had the interests of Wall Street and capital behind him. TR began to get rather nervous, and consequently his rhetoric got strong again. And um, he went off on this 
uh, unprecedentedly large cross-country tour in the spring of 1903. He crossed from coast to coast. He traveled 14,000 miles, spoke something like, uh, made something like 360 speeches and countless other Im improvisatory remarks from the back end of his train. And in the course of this marathon tour, he came up with three of his enduring political catchphrases. In Chicago, speaking about his build-up of the American Navy and the necessity of America having the power to uh, keep South America secure and free from European intervention and influence, he dusted off his speak softly and carry a big stick quote, which he had tried already twice with no success whatsoever, once as governor and once as president. But he used the giant forum in Chicago to passionately repeat it a third time, and this time, speak softly and carry a big stick, stuck, and was the sensation of the newspapers for the next several days, so delighted he repeated it again and again, until he began to swing into the southwest. And mothers, he noticed to his pleasure, uh, were increasingly holding up their babies for him as the train steamed in and out of town. His letter, his race suicide letter, had already been published. So he dusted off his race suicide phrase, made great capital out of that for several states until he got to California. And there, there happened to be a considerable tension between capital and labor. The state was paralyzed with strikes from one end to the other. He coined the third of his great election phrases for 1904, the square deal. He used this phrase, square deal, to describe himself and his attitude to the confronting demands of the American people. Labor on the one side, capital on the other, Democrats versus Republicans, old versus young. He promised to give a square deal to each and to all. The White House door, he promised, would swing open just as quickly to a friend of capital as to a friend of labor. The square deal became a very successful image. As you probably know, it, prolif it um, procreated FDR's New Deal many decades later. At, toward the end of this marathon trip, he was in um, Danforth, Illinois, in fact, it was the very last day of his tour. It was a sodden, green, gray evening. Uh, Illinois was beaten flat by torrential rainstorms. The corn was all flattened. The country seeped and steamed. He was beaten flat by exhaustion. And he found himself standing in front of yet another audience of people standing in the drizzle looking at him with expectant eyes. And he began to speak as he had hundreds of times before with the familiar catchphrases I've just quoted. But then halfway through the speech he suddenly ran out of steam as it were and came up with this really strange image for the first and only time in his rhetoric. He described himself as a black crystal, a crystal with equal-sized facets pointing in all directions. He implied that the presidency is a, a mathematically exact object that has to face in all directions at once, be all things to all men at once. Now he used similar images before and after, he used to talk about politics as being a kaleidoscope of many colors. He used the crystal several times. He always used black and blackness and darkness when he was talking about negatives, death, confusion, destruction, despair. Black care, I quoted just now, really sits behind a rider who paces fast enough. But I've never come across an instance of him combining the crystal and blackness into this strange image the black crystal of the presidency. I've not yet, and I don't think I ever will, figure out exactly what he meant. Uh, it certainly didn't uh, attract any attention whatsoever at the time. It was not quoted in the newspapers. It came and it went. 
But the more I think about it, the more I feel that this image of the black crystal illustrates the fact that Theodore Roosevelt was at heart a bewildered and frightened man. It would explain his frenetic, lifelong, compulsive activity. I think that he looked into the facets of that black crystal, trying to make sense of the, of the impenetrability of human behavior, and could see nothing but his own reflection. I think he was a man who never looked into his own heart because he was afraid of what he might find there. He was a compulsive suppressor of the truth. You probably know the famous story about his young Boston wife, Alice Lee, dying in his, in his youth, and he never referring to her again, either by name or in elusive reference for the rest of his life. He never even spoke of her to, his only, to their only child. There is a total absence in all his writing and all his rhetoric of any inquiry into the spiritual aspects of life, any inquiry into his own psychological motives. There is a willful reluctance to look beyond the surface of human behavior, which is perfectly illustrated for me in the symbol of a polished black crystal, a veneer of civilization on the outside, blackness, and impenetrability within. Well, of course, he recovered from his exhaustion. He went on to an enormously successful election campaign. His rhetoric proved as fertile as ever in his second term. He came up with the man with the muckrake to describe the growing tendency towards sensational journalism. He came up with um, the malefactors of great wealth Later on, after he left the presidency, he campaigned on the progressive ticket in 1912. He threw his proverbial hat into the ring. He became, he proclaimed himself a proverbial man in the arena. He made his proverbial battle cry, we stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. He retained his rhetorical powers right to the end of his life. Even in 1918, when bereaved in war, of his favorite son, he publicly insisted on seeing both life and death as, quotes, quote, part of the great adventure. I'll read you this little passage because it's beautiful writing. Only those are fit to live who do not fear to die, and none are fit to die who have shrunk both from the joy of life and the duty of life. Both life and death are part of the same great adventure. Never yet was worthy adventure worthily carried through by the man who put his personal safety first. His very last words were, a few months after that speech, appropriately, please put out the light. And then at the very darkest hour of a dark, cold January night in 1919, he finally went out into the blackness. This phrase, went out into the back blackness, go out into the darkness, was his own way of describing death, frequently repeated. Americans and all others around the world remembered his lifelong struggle, his lifelong courage, his lifelong conquest of his own bewilderment, and they mourned him. The evidence is they mourn him for all his faults to this day. Thank you. two Harvard historians to comment on Edmund's uh, uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, I think, I don't know, we're going to start with Alan or Ernie? Yeah. Who would we like to start with? Uh, Alan. Alan uh, Brinkley is the Dunwalk Associate Professor of American History at Harvard. A Princeton undergraduate, he earned his master's and doctorate degrees here at Harvard. Winner of the Guggenheim, Woodrow Wilson, and American Council of Learned Society Fellowships. He's the author of a number of books. His 1983 book, Voices of Protest, which was called by the New York Times, quote, a valuable study and fascinating yarn, close quote, won the 1983 American Book Award for History. 
Currently, he's working on another book entitled The Transformation of New Deal Liberalism, American Politics and Ideology, 1937 to 1945. Alan Brinkley. Well, as, uh, is this one? Yeah. Uh, as we were asking uh, Edmund Morris questions after dinner, Graham Allison uh, had a question for Ernest and me, and that was, what does it say about the historical profession uh, that the most interesting and important book about Theodore Roosevelt to have appeared in many decades uh, has been written by a man who is not a member of the historical profession? And Ernest very graciously had that question to me to answer. Uh, <laughs> And, and I have none except to say that, that uh, as an historian, it's, it's a, a great honor to be here tonight uh, and to be able to comment uh, on a lovely and stimulating address uh, by someone who might consider himself to be a very important uh, and distinguished historian, as well as uh, a biographer of remarkable talents. When trying to think of what I, as a historian, could say to add uh, something to a discussion of a man whom I know much less well, of course, than Edmund Morris. Uh, it occurred to me that perhaps one thing uh, that I could do would be to speak in part comparatively and also to speculate a bit about uh, the role of image making in American politics. One of the most frequent complaints about contemporary politics concerns the degree to which image seems to have triumphed over substance, uh, the extent to which personalities have replaced issues. Uh, is the focus of our concern. And we've, in the last 30 years, uh, had two presidents, John Kennedy uh, and now Ronald Reagan, who succeeded brilliantly in making their own personalities, their public images, uh, national preoccupations, and yet who presided over administrations whose substantive achievements were relatively modest, as in the case of John Kennedy, uh, or whose substantive achievements were far more controversial and far less popular uh, than the president himself, as is the case, uh, at least at the moment, with Ronald Reagan. Well, those who, who lament uh, this supposed triumph of style or substance often assume that it's been a peculiarly modern phenomenon, uh, that it's a product of recent changes in our culture and in the media and the product of all of the rise of television. But the problem with that explanation, of course, as Edmund Morris has suggested tonight, is Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt's substantive record as president was, on the whole, rather modest, uh, and his domestic record, in particular, was not very much more impressive than that of his predecessor, William McKinley, who, neither alive nor dead, enjoyed anything uh, like Roosevelt's popularity. But no one, I think, could call Theodore Roosevelt an unimportant president, uh, just as no one, I suspect, is likely to conclude that John Kennedy or Ronald Reagan uh, are, were, or are unimportant presidents. And what made Theodore Roosevelt important, I think, was less what he did uh, than who and what he was uh, and what he came to mean to his contemporaries. It may be, in fact, that no president in American history has had the impact on his own time that Theodore Roosevelt had on the first years of the 20th century. He was not the first president to become a national idol, but he was, I think, the first president to become a national obsession, uh, the first in whom the American public took an intense personal interest in his daily activities, in his habits and interests in his family. Uh, his popularity even translated into a commercial bonanza, uh, a stuffed animal named after him, a teddy bear, uh, became the best-selling toy in the United States. In fact, there were one million teddy bears on sale in New York City uh, in 1907 alone. A book about his childhood, uh, which was written for young readers, uh, A Boy's Life of Theodore Roosevelt, remained one of the most successful children's books in America as late as the 1950s. And he inspired, uh, among many of his admirers, a kind of passionate affection and devotion that probably was matched only by John Kennedy, uh, if by him. Walter Lippmann, here at the end of his life, looking back over the presidents he had known, and he'd known a great many, said, presidents in general are not lovable. They've had to do, much to, they've had to do too much to get where they are. But there was one president who was lovable, Teddy Roosevelt, and I loved him. Well, anyone who's read Ed Morris's wonderful study of Theodore Roosevelt's pre-presidential years is already aware that this remarkable success didn't happen accidentally. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, in 1901, had already spent uh, a lifetime, a short lifetime perhaps, but a lifetime in the careful, energetic promotion of his own personal greatness. This, after all, was the man who, as a senior at Harvard, could confide to his diary, my career, both in and out of college, has been more successful 
successful from that of any man I have ever known. He had spent part of his young adulthood in what he liked to describe as the Wild West, and he'd received significant, significant publicity for that too, about the best of it generated by Roosevelt himself, who, as we've seen tonight, was a talented and successful writer, and who was never more talented or successful than when writing about himself. During the Spanish-American War, uh, he had made Herculean efforts to place himself in battle and to find an opportunity to display heroism and his flamboyant, if militarily useless, charge up San Juan Hill became part of his personal iconography. But what made Theodore Roosevelt more than a character, I think, what made him a symbol to much of the nation of its hopes for and its expectations of greatness was his ability as an image maker to express a vision of national destiny and to identify his own personality with that destiny. Image making, as Edmund Morris has noted, uh, creates lasting changes in perception. And the greatest image uh, and the greatest change in perception, I think, that Theodore Roosevelt uh, was responsible for was not changing the image of himself or of his friends or of his political enemies, but changing the image of the nation. Roosevelt believed that every individual and every nation uh, should stop, strive constantly towards a great goal, that they should look for challenges, not just because the challenges are intrinsically important, but because they are a test of a person's or a nation's character. A person without a destiny or a nation without a destiny is subject to confusion or disorder or decay. And as president, Roosevelt consciously attempted to emulate uh, uh, leaders whom he believed had risen to great destinies, Lincoln above all, uh, because Lincoln was, he believed, the greatest American president, uh, but also because Lincoln had served at a time when the nation faced a transcendent mission. And Roosevelt complained often uh, about how great this was he feared passing them by because conditions weren't such as given the opportunities that Lincoln had had. The country was prosperous, the country was at peace. Uh, he had a great sense uh, of despair at finding himself serving in undemanding times. And he said once, if during the lifetime of a generation no crisis occurs sufficient to call out in a marked manner the energies of the strongest leader, then of course the world does not and cannot know of the existence of such a leader. And in consequence, there are long periods in the history of every nation which, in, uh, during which no man appears who leaves an indelible mark in history. One of the reasons I think he came to hate Woodrow Wilson so bitterly was because Wilson, he thought, was lucky. Wilson had a war in which he was able to seize greatness, and Roosevelt had been cheated out of his war. But Roosevelt, I think, was too modest because even without a war, even without a crisis, he managed to create a sense of great deeds awaiting. He managed to make his mark on his generation and on the presidency, not just by doing things, but by causing things to happen. He provided a model of leadership uh, that fueled a crusade for national reform that he himself was never able to lead, a crusade that culminated first in the presidency of Woodrow Wilson and then later in the presidency of his distant cousin Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt's image of energy and strength and purpose, his image of what Walter Lippmann called what was called mastery, uh, helped persuade other reformers that greater things were possible, helped inspire them to elaborate their ideas and raise their expectations. Uh, Rick Crowley, the author of Butler, The Promise of American Life, uh, a book often identified with Peter Roosevelt's new nationalism, published his book in 1909, uh, at the very end, just after the end of Roosevelt's presidency. Walter Lippmann published uh, his famous book, Drift and Mastery, in 1914. Both of those books were indebted, I believe, to Theodore Roosevelt and to the image of leadership that he had provided. Roosevelt's mother was a figure who illuminated progressive possibilities uh, more than he achieved progressive goals. Well, Roosevelt, I don't think, would have been a successful television. I don't think uh, Adam Morris probably would agree. Uh, he had, from all reports, a high, squeaky, and not especially attractive voice. Uh, he exhibited a kind of nervous energy that I'm sure would have translated well to her ways. But Roosevelt was successful, I think, in precisely the same way that the masters of the television era have been successful. And the secret of his success, I believe, of theirs was nothing so simple as media skills. It was his ability to express 
and perhaps more importantly to embody something Americans in all eras have yearned for and valued and celebrated and found it very difficult to live without. And that's a sense of destiny, a sense of a great national goal. Our history is filled with presidents whose substantive achievements have been more impressive than Theodore Roosevelt's, but who were only dimly noticed by the contemporaries and even more dimly remembered by later generations. But there are a few uh, presidents, and Theodore Roosevelt is certainly one of them, who have managed to transcend the boundaries of their substantive accomplishments and to make image not just an instrument of personal advancement, but also a source of public energy and commitment. And so when we talk about the importance of image in modern national leadership, I think we should pause before concluding too quickly that it has always been a superficial or deceptive force distracting us from our real concerns. In the case of Theodore Roosevelt, who is the reason for our being here tonight, and in the case of John Kennedy, who is one of the reasons for the building uh, in which we're moving, image did, I think, do more than enhance personal careers. It also changed the way the nation thought and acted. And whether historians will say the same about how our more recent master of public image, Ronald Reagan, remains to be seen. Uh, but of course, we're fortunate to have with us tonight someone who may play some part in answering that question. My final comment tonight uh, will come from Ernest May, who is the Charles Warren Professor of History in the Department of History. I'm a professor here at the John F. Kennedy School of Government as well. Born in Fort Worth, Texas, Ernie was educated at UCLA. He served previously as Dean of Harvard College, Director of the Institute of Politics here at the school, and Chairman of the History Department. The author of more than a dozen books, whose most recent publication is entitled Thinking in Time, The Uses of History for Decision Makers, which was co-authored with Richard Neustrat. I bought a copy of the book since it's just been published, and you might be encouraged to buy one at the Coop, so Ernest May. I read the... Uh, of uh, being at the Wilson Center in Washington with uh, Edmund Morris, we were fellows at the same time there. So I had uh, not only come to know Edmund, but I had seen him perform in uh, colloquia there, and uh, therefore uh, I assumed what well, has turned out to be the case that uh, he would uh, leave the, the rest of us on the panel with the uh, very little to say except to express our admiration for what he had, had uh, done. And all I want to do really is to, uh, to say that and to raise a couple of questions. And they are uh, a little like the questions that uh, Alan was suggesting, imperative questions. <coughs> 